Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Polarian Imaging PLC Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just simply type in your question and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. These will be available via your InvestorMeet company dashboard, and we will send you an email to notify you when they are ready for your review. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll. And I'd also like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. I'd now like to hand over to Richard Hollihan, CEO, and Charles Chuck Osborne, CFO from Polarian Imaging. Good afternoon to you both. Uh, good afternoon. Hi. Uh, good afternoon to everyone there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. We, we very much appreciate your time and attention today. Uh, so without further ado, I'll uh, launch into the, the deck here. Uh, so the, the first slide uh, typically doesn't spend much time up on the screen during a presentation, but I think in our case, we'll just take a few moments to uh, parse some of the words here because they are important and they'll give us some guidance during the uh, course of the presentation. So this is about breathtaking images. So Polarian is a drug device company uh, using an inert noble gas uh, Xenon 129 uh, as a contrast agent in medical imaging. So this is about uh, taking breaths, of course, uh, much in the public uh, mind lately based on the pandemic. And we'll have a few things to say about that as well. So we are a novel commercial stage company, commercial stage in that under the regulations for drugs and devices, we are able to provide uh, academic researchers with this technology on a global basis. And we have been doing that for a number of years. Uh, so we're out there with an install base of equipment. We'll talk about that. And then uh, finally, a differentiated pulmonary functional imaging technology. And so a little bit of the backstory here is that um, virtually every form of medicine, um, oncology, cardiology, uh, musculoskeletal imaging, and internal medicine uh, was revolutionized by the introduction of first CT and then MR, uh, both of which uh, came to the world courtesy of the United Kingdom. Um, but in a very cruel twist of physics and physiology, pulmonary medicine was to a great degree left behind. Um, and we'll talk about why that was and how we have come to, uh, to solve that problem. Um, so just a bit about Chuck and myself. So my background is 30 years in the field doing only this. Uh, I'm one of those guys who came directly out of university into what was then GEC's US medical imaging company known as Picker International. Uh, one of the founding major OEMs in CT and MR, um, and then uh, worked with that company, grew up with the technology, uh, rolled MR out to global markets, uh, moved into the business development organization for MR, um, acquired Instrumentarium's MR business for Picker, uh, started a joint venture for the company in Japan, uh, and then moved into the corporate staff in business development. Uh, the company sold, uh, was sold to Philips uh, by the then Marconi organization. And at that point, I left, uh, went into small company world, a company called M2M Imaging uh, that developed bespoke RF coils for MR research, uh, in the course of which I met our founder. And we'll talk about that a little bit longer. Um, Chuck? Yeah, thanks, Richard. Yeah, my name is Chuck Osborne. I've been the CFO for about two years. My background, I've spent the last 28 years in various life science companies, ranging from diagnostics to kind of pure biotech. Over the years, I've done numerous corporate partnering transactions, several M&A transactions, and a couple of NASDAQ listings. I've, I've known the founder here for about 20 years. I've been following this story. And finally, a couple of years ago, they got big enough to need a full-time CFO. And I thought this commercial stage would be really fun. And I have not been disappointed. <laughs> and 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 every day a new adventure. Um, so just a next slide, a little bit. Depending, so many investors tell me they invest in horses. Many tell me they invest in jockeys. My answer is always, why do you have to choose 
So I, I want to talk a little bit about our board of directors in addition to the management team. So our founder was Bastian Driehaus. Dr. Driehaus uh, was one of the first discoverers of the hyperpolarized noble gas imaging field. Um, he did that uh, partly during a tour at GE Amersham uh, and then went back into academia when uh, GE chose not to pursue that technology. He's presently a professor at Duke uh, nearby to the company headquarters in Durham, North Carolina. Jonathan Alice, Dr. Alice is our chairman. Uh, you may also know Jonathan uh, there locally in London as the former CEO of the Sincona-backed startup known as Blue Earth Diagnostics. Uh, Jonathan and Bastian were contemporaries at GE Amersham. Uh, Jonathan, about three years earlier than us, um, also retrieved a molecule of interest in nuclear medicine or in PET, uh, as they call it. Uh, that, uh, that compound became the drug Axumen around which Blue Earth was developed. Uh, that compound was commercialized, taken to market, and last year, uh, Bracco acquired that company from Sincona for about 450 million pounds. Uh, Jonathan is our chairman, and of course, that means he has just done everything we are about to do uh, here at Polarium. Uh, Ken West is our former COO, now retired, but a non-executive director. Uh, Ken is a life sciences and medical device uh, specialist uh, operating in Research Triangle Park there in North Carolina. Uh, very happy to have him on our board. Uh, Jürgen Laucht. Uh, Jürgen is the former managing director of Newchem Isotopes, uh, one of our founding strategic investors. Uh, Newchem saw this opportunity because their special purpose in life is the global sourcing of isotopes for use in medicine and industry. And they actually were catalytic in the IPO of the company and remain on our board and continue to invest even in the most current round. Uh, Cyril Pettit uh, is the appointed director from Bracco. Bracco came in the prior round, also participated over pro rata in this round. And of course, Bracco is a large global manufacturer of contrast agents in medical imaging. So taken together as a whole, a group of industry and domain specialists skilled in the art uh, doing exactly what Polarian is about to go do now. Um, so, you know, working with the Stiefel folks, we developed a scorecard for the uh, kind of parameters or topics of achievement that would be required for a company doing what we're trying to do. And we'll just tick through what those things are here. So we are a drug device combination company. We're using the hyperpolarized form of xenon-129, which is an inert noble gas, to enhance magnetic resonance imaging of the lung. And by that, we mean uh, the patient inhales uh, the hyperpolarized gas, uh, briefly holds it for a breath hold, and we uh, create the images that we then present to radiologist and pulmonologist. We have importantly completed our phase three clinical trials, which is a, a big milestone in uh, de-risking both the technical and regulatory uh, risks in the business. Uh, we would say that we face a, a near-term commercial opportunity, which is the total addressable market of patients with uh, pulmonary disease presently being uh, poorly met by the technologies currently used by physicians in trying to treat those patients. And we'll talk about that in some detail, uh, both in terms of those other technologies and the actual scale of those markets. Um, we are in market. So by that, I mean, we are selling our uh, product to the high end of academic research, uh, both in the US and in Europe. We have equipment there in the UK at places like Oxford and Nottingham. Um, and so that, that is uh, not a mean feat for a small company and keeping those kinds of customers uh, happy and supported and satisfied, also an important uh, skill to have. Uh, we do have a 10 year uh, supply agreement with the German company Linda. Uh, Linda is the world's largest producer of bulk xenon. Uh, that comes from the 
uh, industrial process of air separation. That's a mature industry out there, um, but they're the biggest ones in the world. Uh, and they handle not only uh, the raw supply of xenon inbound, uh, but also on the backside handle our uh, GMP certified blending, packaging, and distribution to hospitals uh, of our drug product. Uh, so very happy to be uh, partnered with them in that way. Uh, we have reached the point uh, in the regulatory process where we have submitted our NDA or new drug application because we're a drug device, uh, we are being handled by the drug side of the house at the FDA. So our submission takes the form of an NDA. So we made that submission in October of last year, and we're currently holding an action date, a PDUFA date of October 5th of this year uh, for approval uh, by the FDA. That includes the standard 10-month uh, timeframe for the review of the submission combined with a 60-day uh, time frame, because we're also requesting uh, Hatch-Waxman protection for our drug. Um, in the U.S., Hatch-Waxman protection is the regulatory rather than legal or, or patent-based, the regulatory grant of market exclusivity for a new drug. And so they get an, an additional 60 days to consider that uh, submission. Um, so we do make note of the fact, um, and, and some of this is by virtue of discovery post-IPO, that in addition to the kind of doctors and patients attributes of our drug device combination, there's also a B2B or business to business opportunity here that has to do with the fact that our technology uh, could act in concert with others in the field uh, and by that, I mean, we have noticed that our technology could play a key role in drug discovery and in the clinical trials of pharma for the pharma industry, kind of outside of uh, doctors and patients in the classic sense of the word. And also for all of those things that everyone is very familiar, uh, either personally or in their extended family in the field of cardiology that has to do with putting stents in vessels or valves in hearts, there are now analogs in pulmonary medicine uh, being approved and coming into clinical use. Uh, those things have to do with stenting airways for disease states that have to do with restrictions or constrictions in airways, and also installing valves in the airways to preclude airflow into areas of lung that have been damaged by disease and therefore would not benefit from being ventilated. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later, but those are kind of separate additional uh, addressable markets uh, for us. And then finally, uh, uh, taking all of the above as read, it's very important to have both a management team and a board uh, with do specific domain experience and a demonstrated track record of execution uh, in doing these kinds of things, and, and I would assert that we do have that. Uh, this is just a quick look across the breadth of pulmonary disease, uh, just demonstrating briefly at a high level how our technology appears in these disease states. So the tradition for presenting these is a healthy volunteer on the left, so these are usually postdocs in the academic institutions volunteering. And so the three compartments or three uh, evaluation criteria for pulmonary function in descending order in the left column then are ventilation on the top. That's simply I ask you to take a deep breath and you either can or cannot fully inflate your lungs. So that's ventilation. Uh, the second criteria is the performance of the barrier tissue of the lungs, and that would be the form of the alveolar walls where oxygen goes in and CO2 comes out of the bloodstream ordinarily. And so we ask you to take a deep breath. You do. Ventilation works. Uh, once you're fully ventilated, what happens uh, at the endpoints of those airways at the alveolar structure? Uh, does gas transit into arterial blood and come out of venous blood? Uh, and so we, you can see that we can characterize that uh, quantitatively, and this, this is critically important. And then finally, uh, once 
uh, the contrast agent uh, goes through the barrier tissue or the alveolar wall into the capillaries. It's then simply dissolved in blood as an MR contrast agent, and we can see it uh, as it has been uh, transferred by the red blood cells. So taken as a whole, uh, kind of the end-to-end -end answer to every question that a pulmonologist might have about how your lungs are working. And then from left to right across the spectrum there, just a number of familiar diseases uh, and the way that our technology varies in its presentation of information to clinicians. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is one of the forms of interstitial lung disease where that alveolar wall becomes fibrotic and impedes the exchange of gas uh, to arterial blood. And so here you see quite clearly in the middle image uh, that the barrier tissue signal has gone astray in a very significant way here. So despite the fact that the patient is able to ventilate, uh, they still cannot uh, exchange gas correctly. And so uh, this should sound familiar. This is the case of people who have, uh, for example, uh, survived some dysfunction but still can't make it up a flight of stairs without pausing to rest. That's a dysfunction in gas exchange. Uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is that form of pulmonary dysfunction where unfortunately virtually every aspect of pulmonary function is impeded or dysfunctional. So I ask you to take a deep breath, but you can't. So your lungs aren't fully inflated. Uh, because they're not fully inflated, you can't exchange gas in those areas that are impeded. And then because you can't gas exchange, red blood cells can't transport gas to the rest of the human body as it should. And so now you can see the characteristic appearance of COPD using our technology. Um, this is important because some of the big uh, kind of medical decisions going on in hospitals every day are... Um, the, the history of these kinds of patients and pulmonary disease follows this pattern where patients are stable for a while in some kind of therapeutic uh, regime. And then for some reason they fall over and go astray and something goes wrong. And the question is uh, what has happened? How much of it has happened? Uh, can we gain control of this uh, cycle of exacerbation, infection, inflammation, and tissue damage. And then importantly, once we do have that under control, when is the right time to send you home in a new stable state? Uh, the next vertical column uh, known as pulmonary arterial hypertension is a form of pulmonary vascular disease. Um, everyone knows what hypertension is. Your primary care physician probably puts a, an inflatable cuff around your arm and pumps it up to see what your blood pressure is, but that's your systemic whole body blood pressure. Um, and this is not that. This is just the vessels that go between the heart and lungs, the pulmonary vascular structure, and it is inaccessible to clinicians non-invasively. So this is the form of hypertension uh, where patients have it for many years, typically until they fall over from the consequences of it, then they wind up being hospitalized and there's a mad scramble to find out what's happened to you. Uh, we have discovered that we are able to assess uh, this arterial blood flow <clears throat> in the capillaries of the alveolar wall and help clinicians make the determination of whether you have pulmonary arterial hypertension or not. And this is done totally non-invasive using the same technology of our inhaled inert noble gas contrast agent. Because the only other way that patients uh, can be diagnosed uh, currently is by threading a catheter through your femoral artery, uh, up through your heart and out the other side into the vasculature between the heart and lungs. So this is a, this is a tremendous new discovery. We've found this even since our IPO uh, very excited about where this goes because this, of course, moves the technology from pulmonary medicine into cardiology, which is another huge market segment in its own right. So very excited about this. Radiation therapy is not so much uh, pulmonary medicine either. However, uh, a large part of 
oncology has to do with treating lung cancer. And in lung cancer, uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy are performed on patients in addition to surgery um, to try to get uh, the best possible outcome for the patient. Uh, in radiation therapy, of course, this is the delivery of some kind of a particle-based dose to the tumor uh, in hopes of killing the tumor first while preserving the greatest amount of functional tissue uh, in and around the, those particle beam therapies. Right now, that problem of planning radiation therapy is most, mostly conceptualized as one of geometry, where they try to plan a pathway from the source of the radiation to the tumor, transiting the minimum amount of healthy tissue. The key question there is, what healthy tissue, right? Which healthy tissue? How healthy is it? And we're able to fully characterize the function of the entire lung so that we can tell the oncologist what pathways are the best ones to use for treating this patient's tumor. So also takes us into the form of oncology. And you probably saw the RNS recently about our mo most recent order from the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, one of the global leaders in cancer research. And then finally, and, and perhaps most familiarly in everyone's extended family is the case of asthma. Uh, the classic case, I ask you to take deep breath, you can't. And so this is pure airway obstructive disease. And here you can see that they aren't ventilating, which means that they can't do gas exchange, which means that they can't transfer to red blood cells. And this is uh, the kind of a full end-to-end -end characterization of the asthma patient. Um, so a little bit about the, the backstory then. So we formed this by securing uh, the intellectual property of the suspended program at GE uh, for our exclusive use. We did form the company there in Durham adjacent to Duke, which is our home base from a clinical research point of view. Uh, we are located there in Durham. We did list the company on the AIM uh, exchange. We, we found the combination of investors and environment to be the best one for us. This, this would not have been possible in the US on the NASDAQ, for example. And we've now grown the company and the slide is now <laughs> outdated as of this week. So we're uh, some 180 million pounds or so now uh, on, the, on the AIM market. Uh, this is also pre the financing, uh, but these folks of course all came along in the financing. So you would, re you would recall these names. So the Amadi Global Investors VCT Fund, uh, Brocco and Newcam both came along in the round. Uh, Chelbert and Tyndall and Canaccord likewise. Um, so now to the right-hand side, uh, just starting to drill down a little bit on some of the assertions we've made so far. Um, so pulmonary disease in the U.S. currently affects some 40 million uh, people. Uh, that's pre-COVID. Uh, with COVID, I would add 25 million to that number. Um, and in the U.S., uh, based on the current set of tools that pulmonologists and clinicians have to use, the U.S. healthcare delivery system uh, bears some $150 billion a year as the burden of trying to take care of these patients. Uh, it's a difficult case. And of course, you would know that these patients, in contrast to some of those in medicine, where diagnosis leads to cure, uh, in this case, in pulmonary disease, diagnosis leads to a therapeutic regime that controls disease progression and preserves function to the greatest degree, but the patients aren't cured. So uh, once you're in this cohort of patients, then you wind up as um, someone who could potentially benefit from our technology over the course of your life. Um, so we do have a drug device combination product. Uh, that does visualize Xenon 129 using existing MR technology. We've deployed our technology on all of the current manufacturers of, of MR systems. So that includes GE Siemens and Philips on a global basis and using that technology then uh, able to visualize as we just uh, kind of explained end-to-end uh, -end explanations of pulmonary function. Uh, the beauty of this is, having just explained that these patients will be treated recurrently over their lives, if you are choosing a technology to do that with, 
you would like it to be non-invasive and not using radiation. And so we are that. Um, happily, we're also more accurate and less harmful than many other current techniques. And we'll talk about that in some detail um, and including the fact that our reproducibility or repeatability uh, is low single digits uh, makes this uh, key as a tool because as you all know from a lifetime of studying kind of quality assurance in industry and medicine, the fundamental principle of quality is you have to be able to measure it if you want to manage it. And until we arrived, uh, measuring pulmonary function was uh, not an easy feat. And then finally at the bottom, and we'll talk briefly about this, although we're not basing uh, our business on it, um, we can't help but notice uh, being surrounded by the pandemic uh, that there is this situation where uh, patients who survive wind up with these lingering problems having to do with their pulmonary function. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, this is a slide about our, our history in London on the AIM market there. Uh, Chuck, could I ask you to talk about this slide? Sure. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, as Richard mentioned, we went public on AIM in March of 2018 with the, the purpose of funding our U.S. clinical trials and getting our NDA filed in the U.S. And along the way, we've kind of called our milestones in advance and then financed towards those milestones. And then we, as we achieved those, we'd get the next round of funding. Over the time period, we got a good track record of doing what we say we're going to do. And we've significantly de-risked the company. So when we filed our NDA in the fall of last year, I think the stock market recognized that and uh, we achieved this over 100, 100 million pound market cap. A key point to make on this slide is that we have done this with a, about 20 million pounds of invested capital coming up to this financing round. And that's, that's due to our very cash efficient business model. Um, we were able to leverage the significant investment GE made in the technology before they spun it out. And then we sell the polarizers in the research market over the last several years. And we sell them for about a half million dollars each. We make about a 60% gross margin. We use that gross margin to partially offset our development costs. So that's allowed us to build what we think is a, a very nice 100 million pound market cap company with very little capital. And that set us up for our, the fundraising we just did. So now that we can go launch the product. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Chuck. I, I think you could also uh, you could also um, make the assertion that 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 this slide could have a couple of different titles. Uh, one of them is uh, the history of capital raising. Uh, one of them is the history of kind of declaring milestones, funding them, and achieving them. And another one uh, perhaps has to do with, uh, with declaring a kind of regulatory objectives and accomplishing them. Um, and so this is important in establishing credibility, uh, not only with customers, but also investors and regulators. So it's, it's kind of a information rich slide in, in that regard. Thank you. Um, so there's continuing to drill this a bit so that you get a sense for uh, for the market that we face. Several of the questions came in about what the what the scale of the market opportunity is. So in the US, which is our first um, regulatory approved market and the and the place where we're going to launch the the technology first, uh, that we've talked about the 40 million patients that exist, and they break down in this way, 25 million to asthma, 16 million to COPD, a half a million to PAH, uh, another quarter of a million for interstitial lung disease, IPF, 100,000 on top of that. If I were to project this to the global, uh, the global scheme, of course, asthma becomes 340 million patients globally in the markets that we can address. Uh, COPD, 25 million, PAH, a million, and then just kind of scaling those things down accordingly. Um, given that these patients want, once diagnosed and in the care of a pulmonologist, uh, if they become uh, part of our set of addressable patients, you, you can instantly see that over the lifetime of a single patient, the opportunity to be recurrently scanned 
so that your pulmonologist can make sure that your therapeutic regime is keeping you at the highest level of pulmonary function um, gets to be a very large number very quickly, right? So that's the scale of the market opportunity that we see in front of us. Uh, of course, in the rest of the world, there are very large markets that have either much poorer air quality or much higher uh, prevalence of smoking uh, than, than the US and EU. And of course, those markets would then have even higher prevalences of disease locally to address. Um, on the right-hand side, just to kind of make a diagram of a little bit of the hand-waving we did on the tour through pulmonary medicine to begin with. So this is right out of your kind of high school biology book. This is a picture of an alveoli, the terminal endpoint of your lung structure. Uh, so uh, ventilation is air traveling down the airways to this point. Uh, so obstructive airway diseases, you can't ventilate, so it doesn't make any difference how your alveoli perform if you can't get air to them. And then finally, ventilation being all right, uh, you do ventilate, but then something goes amiss when air gets to the terminal endpoint because gas exchange doesn't work correctly and therefore RBC transfer doesn't work correctly. Um, and so we can visualize all of those things and then now most, most excitingly and, and most recently, the ability to actually see the blood flow in the capillaries and help cardiologists characterize pulmonary vascular disease. So very excited about the sum of these things. Um, so all great things. Uh, the question always is, love the technology, love the, th love the theory of this. Uh, how do you fit in the hospital? How do you work your way into a day in the life of a pulmonologist. So when we get there, and, and because we are there, here's what we see as, as competing technologies for, for ours. Uh, spirometry is the least expensive, most ubiquitous form of assessing pulmonary function. Uh, if you've been in a hospital or have a family member who has, you probably have seen this. And this is blowing in a plastic tube, right? This is attempting to assess the capacity of your lungs uh, by expiring your breath. So a couple of things are true. One is it requires effort. Uh, in order to do pulmonary function testing, you have to be up for some exertion. Um, and so there are fair swaths of the pulmonary patient population for which that level ex of exertion is difficult. Um, also gets harder uh, at the younger end of the age spectrum for patients. Uh, likewise, symmetrically gets harder for the upper end of the age spectrum of patients in doing this. And then finally, if you do have one of these diseases and you're doing this for a doctor uh, all the time or periodically throughout your life, uh, eventually many patients get to the point where they just choose not to play. And so that, that also compounds the problem. Uh, even on a good day with everyone doing what they're supposed to, the reproducibility of this technology is on the order of 15%. So not a very helpful tool as a fundamental principle for quality or measurement. Bronchoscopy is using an endoscope, um, a visible light endoscope to inspect the upper reaches of airways. So there are 23 branches of airways on the way to the alveolar terminal point. Uh, this can see about the upper six. So not a tool for assessing the distal ends of airways. And you would guess, um, even if you weren't a doctor, that, air, that disease frequently starts at the small end and works up. So it plays a part. It plays a part in uh, tissue samples for biopsy for lung cancer. It plays a part in obstructive upper airway disease, but it will never be a continuous daily use recurrent tool in for most of these patients. Scintigraphy, which is also known as nuclear medicine, is the form of imaging that requires a patient to either inhale a radioactive ga gas or be injected with a radioactive intravenous contrast agent or both to answer a question about pulmonary function. And even after all of that, it's low resolution and two-dimensional. So we don't see that as uh, sticking around very long after we make it to market. X-ray and CT are there, 
Uh, X-ray and CT, uh, of course, are exquisite spatial resolution images, uh, but spatial resolution has to do with the structure of lungs and not their function. And so uh, if you've had a pulmonary disease for so long that the structure of your lungs have been altered, should we not find a technology that can find disease sooner than that? And we would argue yes. And if you had a choice about whether to use radiation or not on your family member over the course of their life being evaluated, would you rather not use something that didn't use radiation? And we think, yes, people would rather not do that. MR without us uh, doesn't see much because air does not create a signal in an MR machine to be detected. So an image of your lungs looks exactly like this. It's a large black hole in the center of your chest. However, uh, it does give us great information about the specific volume of your thoracic cavity, which we make good use of. And then finally on the right, using our hyperpolarized noble gas imaging in a single breath hold scan. So this is virtually the fastest scan that can be done on an MR machine. Uh, we obtain the information to assess pulmonary function. Um, what does our kit look like? So our drug blend goes to the hospital courtesy of the Linda people uh, in a gas classic gas cylinder. Um, our polarizer is really, as you might have already guessed, um, it's really a large laser beam uh, based technology. We're optically pumping uh, the Xenon 129 to excite it. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we get a one times 10 to the five enhancement in the signal level of the xenon. So that's a 100,000 fold increase in signal. So not a fine point in terms of detection. Uh, we dispense that into a disposable single use dose delivery bag uh, because the FDA views that we are manufacturing a drug at the point of use uh, we're required to certify that. So part of our system does that. It certifies the level of polarization achieved by the polarizer. And then it also provides an environment, you can see on the top there, uh, a parking spot uh, to keep the drug after it's been hyperpolarized, uh, which allows us to decouple the process of making the drug, which takes about 15 minutes, from the process of handling the patient in the MR machine because uh, you know, kind of orchestrated choreographed uh, processes in a hospital are kind of fraught with peril in terms of trying to happen at a point in time uh, uh, simultaneously. And so we didn't want that to be required. And so I think important to separate those two workflows. So that, that, left, that leaves the operator free to position the patient, make them comfortable, get them ready for the procedure. And then finally, uh, bring the drug over and do the classic take a deep breath, don't breathe, don't move, hold it uh, command. And in a single breath hold later, we have the data to do uh, the analysis and present the images to the clinicians. Um, this is, uh, I've stolen this out of a clinical workup just to present the, the story uh, to you. So most of radiology lives in the upper left-hand corner of this image. Uh, and by that, I mean they live in the world of qualitative grayscale imaging. That's actually kind of how radiology was invented, uh, having somebody look at two-dimensional grayscale imaging and interpret anatomy from there. Uh, what we do then is bring the signal from our inhaled gas contrast agent, uh, do some image subtraction using conventional te arithmetic techniques, uh, use the patient's own thoracic cavity as the determinant of total volume, which is, which is the right way to do that. Uh, apply some statistics and out the other side comes a red is bad, green, is, green and blue are great, uh, color encoded scale for displaying, uh, in this case, ventilation. So you can see that this patient has some significant problems in ventilation. And this is a single two-dimensional slice out of the three-dimensional volume acquisition that we made in the breath hold scan. So the beauty of this is manifold, right? On the one hand, it is the tool a radiologist would use to read and say, 
ventilation defect, right? It's also the image that the radiologist would send to the pulmonologist saying, I'd like to talk to you about your patient's ventilation defect. Uh, it's also the image that the pulmonologist would use to communicate with the respiratory therapist and the patient about the extent and condition of the patient's situation. So it creates this common platform of dialogue vertically throughout the entire spectrum of care providers in the institution that completely explains in an intuitive and obvious way what's going on with this patient. Um, and, and you would know as former patients in hospitals that this is not the normal course. So now let's apply this to a couple of specific cases. On the left-hand side is an asthma patient. This, this imaging would also be called a drug therapy response imaging. So on the left-hand side, the patient before they have used their inhaler. Um, and so we measure quantitatively assess their ventilation deficit to be 34%. They use the inhaler. We image them again, and we can tell the clinician that drug solves this patient's ventilation problem to this degree, right? So as you would probably know, most patients, most asthma patients are running around with inhalers that have multi-drugs in them. And so the clinical uh, case question here is which drugs for which patients? because although some of these drugs work beautifully, some of them don't work at all for some patients. And otherwise, the way this gets sorted out is six to nine months of empirically sending people home with different drugs in their pockets and then asking them to come back and tell doctors how they feel and whether they worked or not, right? You've probably, several of you already been through that process yourself. On the right-hand side is just the reduction to images of the assertion we made earlier about the appliances that are installed in lungs now. This is one for an airway stent. And so you can see the patient pre-stent and post-stent quantitatively assessing the benefit of the therapeutic regime. Of course, this procedure is done in an operating room with an interventionalist. It's an expensive procedure. And so you would want to make sure that you did it right. Uh, just a quick word about the COVID study. Uh, so the Oxford folks using our technology did assess some COVID long haulers in a small cohort trial. trial. And so what they're demonstrating here is that the existing armamentarium of medicine would call these patients normal, and we can clearly show that they are not. Uh, we're about to stand up a larger trial uh, with the folks at Oxford there uh, to extend this to non-hospitalized and other uh, broader applications in the post-COVID case. Uh, just a quick word about our clinical trial. Uh, one of the things that you would uh, want to do is assess our probability of success at the FDA. So our trial was a head-to-head -head equivalence trial versus a comparator in that we are required by the FDA to choose two clinical indications or medical problems in which we demonstrate an ability to uh, affect a medical decision. So our two indications were lobe resection surgery and lung transplant surgery, where the surgeons want to know a priori uh, what the effect of removing the lobe uh, would be on the patient's vital capacity, or in the case of transplant, which of the lungs to take first, even if it's a bilateral transplant, because they want to take the smaller or weaker lung first in case anything were to go astray in the procedure. And so what we can say out of that trial was uh, we met uh, the primary endpoints in the trial handily. Um, and importantly, uh, during the course of both of the trials at all of the sites, uh, not a single uh, significant adverse event attributed uh, to our drug. So the FDA's charter is assessing primarily safety and efficacy. And so we would say um, we like our achievement in this clinical trial, and we think it supports our uh, submission strongly. Uh, so where to from here? So we've done our new drug uh, application. Uh, we've made the request for Hatch-Waxman protection. We are full into uh, the post-submission uh, back and forth with the FDA that always goes on with questions and answers coming as they go through the review process. 
Uh, we performed the orientation meeting, which is elective and was requested by them. Uh, that went well. It also allowed us the opportunity to bring them absolutely current on the state of the technology and what we're using it uh, for in research. So that was a great opportunity for us. And, and additionally, now we are through our mid-cycle review uh, in the review process. And so that's a milestone um, and an achievement as well. Uh, we are full into the commercialization research on the so-called coding coverage and payment side of all of this in U.S. healthcare. Of course, there are kind of three big uh, chunks of uh, business in healthcare. One is Medicare, uh, one is private insurance, and one is the Veterans Administration hospital chains. And so we have this research uh, going on in all three of those domains. And so far, happy to report that our assumptions going in are uh, being more likely found as floors than ceilings with respect, th with respect to things like price. Um, so what else uh, is going on? So on the B2B side of this, um, we, we've said that we have 24 out there. If you were to enter uh, Xenon 129 as a, as a search term in clinicaltrials.gov on the FDA's website, you would find that there are some 42 trials up and running out there already. Uh, with people investigating uh, the use of this uh, technique and our drug device in pulmonary medicine and in drug uh, discovery. And we also think that it could be that we wind up being designated as a biomarker, uh, reminding us that we had a three-year SBIR grant with the C Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, the title of which was the use of Xenon-129 as a biomarker in cystic fibrosis. Uh, cystic fibrosis is a special uh, piece of pulmonary medicine. We have a cluster of sites, including Cincinnati, Sick Kids in Toronto, and BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, all specializing in pediatric uh, investigations and research and cystic fibrosis. Uh, this, this is a very exciting slide supporting the B2B opportunity on pharma discussion. So on the left-hand side is a single patient scanned twice. So the upper image is a patient scanned showing a ventilation uh, performance. We take them out of the scanner, walk them down the hall, bring them back, put them back in the machine and scan them again. The left-hand scatter plot is the statistical performance of our ability to assess a ventilation deficit, right? 1%, 1.5%. The right-hand scatter plot is the current endpoint in use in drug discovery for respiratory pipeline drugs. That's spirometry and the statistical performance or reproducibility of that technique is plus or minus 7% plus. So if I give those two charts to a biostatistician and say, I would like to design a clinical trial to prove that I can detect a 2% difference in ventil ventilation deficit, and I want to have a statistical power of 90% and an alpha of 0.05 in both trials, please tell me how many subjects I would need in each trial to prove that case. And as you can see from the chart, it would be 24 using our technology and 542 using the existing standard of care. Um, and so I think in our trial, we can say that every subject in our clinical trial costs us on the order of $60,000 a piece. So the other title to this slide could be, would you rather spend a million dollars or 25 to get to the answer of yes or no in drug discovery? So we're very excited about this and we have a handful of preliminary discussions going on with people about this. Uh, so where are we in commercial? So uh, we have submitted our NDA. We're in our launch prep uh, phase. Uh, so we've mentioned before our strategy here is to go directly to the high end of academic medicine in the U.S. Uh, this is analogous to the way that CT and MR uh, went to market. Um, and this is important because this is where all of the sorting out of clinical pathways and recommendations for use 
and all of the academic papers on the subject get published. So we're new in this, we're small, but we do have, as you know, over a thousand peer reviewed journal articles already. Uh, those are now heading from science and technology into clinical medicine as topics and very happy uh, about all that. And then finally, we talked about the fact that we're full on to the coverage coding and payment research in, in the reimbursement side of this and happy about what we see there. Um, so how do we find these center of excellence uh, sites? And so we actually commissioned primary research and said, we want to define a center of excellence in pulmonary medicine as uh, a site that has a cystic fibrosis care center. The cystic fibrosis folks are quite unique among pulmonary disease in that they have a $3 billion war chest, which is the sum of the royalties that they've received from Vertex for the drug Kaleidico. And they have built a nationwide network of like-minded centers focused on the care of these very special pediatric patients, right? And so putting that money to work, there are a hundred of those sites out there. Um, there are IPF care centers, PAH care centers, lung transplant programs, and then institutions running asthma, COPD, pulmonary and critical care medicine, academic training programs, in addition to fellowship training programs. So fellowship training programs are docs uh, taking sabbaticals, going between sites to be specially trained in the technique and then taking that technique home, which is part of the story about how this technology gets propagated. So when we do that, we color encode these. We know exactly who they are. We know exactly where they are. We know who the department chairs are. And we simply slide this chart on top of the ones that we know and love already who are specialists in magnetic resonance imaging research. And that gives us the target list for our sites for the first several years post introduction. On the left hand side are the names of the sites where we already have systems. So Duke, North Carolina, Virginia, UC Children's, Chicago, Missouri, Wisconsin, Iowa, Kansas, and MD Anderson, all of the biggest and brightest and best uh, large institutions in the US leading uh, research in these fields. Um, so a little bit about the uh, backstory here. We have great technology. We're going to launch our offense. What can we say about defense? So we do have all the patents uh, that we got from GE in addition to the patents that we've developed since that time. Uh, those, those things span uh, the, uh, the spectrum of imaging methods, hyperpolarization methods, RF coil methods, image computation and display techniques. Uh, and so a great fort uh, in that regard. We're going to uh, layer that with the Hatch-Waxman protection and our orange book there. And with that, we believe we'll have something like five to seven years of a head start on this market without competition. Which leads us back to uh, the start. So our report card before we started, now we've, uh, now we've explained enough to actually uh, give you the tools to assign us grades in these categories. Uh, be happy to discuss those things. But um, a drug device combination, the approval is for the inseparable pair, which is the beauty of not only the FDA regulatory state, but also a description of our business model, because in addition to the capital equipment sale, which is a by institution one-time process, we then also get paid every time the machine is used on a patient, which is what differentiates us, for example, from uh, GE Siemens and Philips. Uh, and I think we've explained that we face a near-term commercial opportunity in the sum of all of the patients with pulmonary disease. Uh, we're out there already with 24 installed and operating. We have strategic investors and partners supporting the business end-to-end -end on the drug side. Uh, we've submitted our NDA and are answering our questions faithfully. Um, and then we see, in addition to the medical implications, the B2B opportunities for devices and drug discovery, all being done by a team of folks who know how to do it. And that is our story. 
Richard, Chuck, thank you very, very much indeed for such a comprehensive uh, presentation and update. Thank you once again. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions, but just while the company take a few moments to review investor questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet Company dashboard, and we will send you an email when that's ready for you to review. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company. Immediately after the presentation has ended, you'll be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, let me just remove the uh, the slides just to make your images just uh, slightly bigger. If you need those back up, guys, just let me know and I'll, I'll bring those in. Um, investors did have the ability to pre-submit questions and you received quite a few of them and uh, some of a, a similar nature. So we've got about a selection of four or five. Having looked at some of the questions that are coming in the live event, I guess some of those may address those, but um, I'm mindful of time as well. So if I just crack on with these questions, the first one is in order to obtain higher value reimbursement CPT codes, what steps need to be undertaken and what would you what would be the estimate of the time needed to conclude this process? Yeah, so we do have a pipeline of products uh, behind our initial ventilation indication. Um, our story has been consistent throughout that we're commercializing on the base of ventilation and our clinical trials uh, as they have been conducted so far. We would have to run trials for succeeding indications and then do the same work that we're doing now. And this is classic kind of healthcare economic research where we present this not only versus the attributes of existing tools being used, but our outright uh, efficiency, reproducibility, and cost advantages, we think, uh, compared to current standards of care. And we have a great set of consultants who are helping us storyboard those presentations to payers as we speak. But those things will unfold uh, over the next 12 to 24 months. Thank you. The next question, have the company got any worries or hesitant that FDA approval won't be achieved? Yeah, so, so anybody who runs a company uh, making regulated products has to answer that question. Yes, we always have concerns. Regulators regulate. But I think if you look at the, if you look at the case objectively, uh, the safety, assessing safety and efficacy, right? Um, we did a head-to-head -head trial. Uh, the results of that from an efficacy point of view are statistical, and the trial was read out successfully. Um, if you look at the safety side of this, we have an inert noble gas that is not metabolized by the human body and exits the same way it enters via expired breath. So we like the safety profile. Also knowing that xenon has been used, uh, approved uh, by regulators uh, in things like anesthesia uh, and also uh, for other forms uh, over the long history of the existing of xenon in medicine. So we don't see the FDA uh, being concerned the way, for example, that they would be with the injectable contrast agents, all of which uh, stay around in the human body and leave by various kidney and liver metabolic processes. So we like the situation, um, but we respond promptly, faithfully, and completely to every question we get from them. And until we're approved, we're not approved. Thank you. Um, if in the future the company has a lot of surplus cash, would they ever think about trying to invest in another form of a technology to create additional revenue, or are they happy just to purely focus on the company's current technology? Well, we have, we've laid out in, in front of you only the first two of the indications we see in pulmonary medicine. Uh, there are people in a research mode who have applied this technology to neuroimaging, uh, and other organ systems in the body, we think it would be quite some time before we had uh, exhausted the R&D uh, pipeline in front of us. Um, aside from that, you also know that we face uh, the opportunity to take this technology into adjacent geographic markets, and all of those things will uh, consume resources and require funding. So I think it will be uh, quite some time before we have exhausted uh, even the apparent opportunities in front of our board and investors. Thank you. Does the company anticipate they have sufficient cash available to cover manufacturing of orders once FDA approval is granted? Yeah, Chuck, would you like to 
take that one? Sure, thanks, Richard. Yes, the, the company believes we raised sufficient cash to launch the product and, and get ready for all the demand that we're going to have. Also, to you know, start exploring some of these other indications as we move forward to increase the the top line of this product as we go forward. Yeah, for just for those of you who have heard uh, the presentation uh, before, you would know already. But we are we are using uh, kind of already skilled specialist contract manufacturing here. So we're not building a factory. Uh, we're using folks who build products for a living very happily. Um, they're adjacent to us there in the, in the Durham area. So we are, in addition to being able to scale, we're also not shipping our components around in containers through ships around the world either. So we like our ability to scale with demand with respect to manufacturing. I think um, just, just really mindful of time and, and perhaps the ability for you just to review some of these questions that have come in. And thank you to all investors that have submitted questions. And for every question that uh, we don't answer, obviously the company will review post the meeting anyway, and we will publish a response where it's appropriate. But perhaps I could go to the final pre-submitted question. In terms of the revenue model, recurring revenues such as revenue per scan, et cetera, is this something that will be able to be charged on the research machines already installed presently, or will they remain, remain for future research only? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, actually. So the, the history of medical imaging, uh, and, and this machine will be in the radiology department uh, adjacent to MR machines. So happily, uh, the big manufacturers of those machines have spent the last 40 years training hospitals to budget and spend money to keep their equipment current and expand it. Um, I think they've also shown uh, the way forward here because there are numerous uh, precedent transactions for people upgrading, enhancing, uh, and replacing install based machines to gain access to newer technology ones. So we think uh, not only will we be able to bring most of the research sites along uh, via upgrades and enhancements, but many times, uh, having proven the case, the FDA approval simply gates a research institution buying a clinical machine and leaving their researchers to do research on the research machine uh, as, as much as us upgrading or converting it. But I think one way or the other, we see most of those folks coming along into the commercial use. Thank you. Um, I know that's not all the pre-submitted questions, but for all of those that did submit them, obviously any any ones that we didn't miss, as, we, as I said, we will uh, publish responses where there, there it is appropriate to do so. Um, Chuck and uh, Richard, perhaps I could just ask you to click on the Q&A tab on the right-hand side of your screen also. And perhaps I know I'm mindful of time and people perhaps have got other things scheduled post the hour that we had. Um, I'll keep an eye on the attendance numbers. Um, you know, we're way over a hundred and something people on the call. So there's still a lot of people because I know feedback is important. So I, I want to give people the opportunity to provide feedback. Perhaps I could ask you just to pick a few questions where you feel uh, you haven't touched on the presentation and then I'll look to uh, close the session. Yeah, let's see. Uh... Um, so just uh, one on the, uh, I'll take this one. There's one that says, would you hope to sell a polarizer to each of the COEs? I, I think the, the pattern here is much the same way that CT and MR happened, uh, which is high end of academic medicine first, uh, and then a couple of years there. And just to scale this, right? In the US, there are some 11,000 hospitals, 1,000 of those are affiliated with academic institutions, and we've targeted the top 100 in the first few years post-approval. Uh, that's pretty much exactly the same way that MR happened, and that is this kind of geometric progression 2, 4, 8, 16, 32 over the first several years, which eventually becomes exponential as the technology unfolds both geographically across the U.S., and then vertically across the span of hospital bed size. So it's a very classic model in that regard. And we would see polarizers in, I mean, all hospitals uh, over the course of the next 10 years.
Yep. So the, uh, there's a question here about the FDA, and and so I'll take that. Um, uh, con it's uh, re with referral to constant communication. And so the, the submission, as you would guess, for a drug device combination uh, is, is fairly complicated. On the one hand, there is everything having to do with the drug and the clinical trial. Uh, and then on the other hand, that, that submission is twinned with what is essentially a 510K on the device or on the polarizer. And so we get questions from both sides of the house as we go forward. Uh, depending on how deeply each of the groups are in uh, their review of their respective sections. The committee is comprised of experts, of course, in each of the domains. So that goes on uh, essentially weekly. Uh, and we have been, since we started, uh, back and forth with them on whatever it is that's on their mind at the moment. Richard, I think um, what I'll do, because I can see there's questions coming in for everyone that you're you're answering, and perhaps it probably be more measured if I give you the opportunity to reflect on those and, uh, as I say, uh, publish these responses back to investors on the call. Um, ahead of, I guess, putting investors through to, to provide you feedback, which I know is important, uh, perhaps I could ask you for a few closing comments um, and then I will look to end the session. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that. So first of all, thanks everyone for their attention and for their time today. Um, I really appreciate your taking the time uh, to come and listen to our story and, and speak to us. Uh, as you all know, um, we came to the AIM market and the reason that we are able to have this discussion today is retail investors. That's how the company started. It was high net worth offices, uh, family businesses, and single uh, kind of in individuals finding uh, the value of our story uh, before anybody else did. So we have a debt to retail investors, which we value and treasure going forward and are always happy to meet and talk with you. Uh, we'll keep in touch via the digital platforms that we currently use uh, and other forms as Walbrook and our advisors um, uh, have us do. Thanks for your time, folks. Richard, Chuck, thank you once again for your um, presenting to investors today. Um, could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback. If you access this meeting from our website, then the feedback page will appear. Alternatively, if you access this meeting via the link sent you by email, please just simply log back in uh, to provide your feedback. And I'm sure it'd be greatly appreciated by the company if you could let them have your views and expectations. On behalf of the management team of Polarian Imaging PLC, I'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Good afternoon to you all.